much good. All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, I'd like you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter number 18 and verse 15. Luke chapter number 18 and verse number 15. The infallible text says, And they brought unto him also infants, that he would touch them. For when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, shall in no wise enter therein. Father, bless his holy word now, and then give me unction to preach it. In thy name we pray, amen. I don't know how to make it any plainer. The Lord Jesus Christ said a little child can come to him. Most little children, unless they've been subjected to the raw perversion I was talking about in Sunday school this morning, most little children are, are guileless, and they're not hardened, and they, are, they receive things on face value, and they put faith and trust in people, and sometimes misplaced, believe me, but they put faith and trust in people. And because of that, then of course they're vulnerable, and uh, if anything touches the heart of this preacher, it is little children to see how they are mistreated and to see what happens to them in this world. Uh, that gets to me. That enrages my soul because of the way I was raised and the way I came up and what I had to deal with as a child. Uh, we had a, a huge family. My, my mother was a, a number, was a, was a part of a big family. She had sisters and she had a brother and we were raised by our grandparents and if uh, and we were boys i was just a boy my my brother was a boy you know how boys are and we would do things and uh, we didn't get disciplined at the time for what we did and then we'd have an aunt or an uncle show up a week or two weeks later and then they'd come in and want to discipline us for something that had happened 2 weeks before that's rough on children and uh, it created within me this, uh, this survival mentality. It also hardened me to certain things. And uh, it put scars in my soul that are still there to this day. And so therefore I understand what children have to endure as they grow up in this world in unfavorable circumstances, which I grew up in. And the Almighty, of course, was grooming and preparing me so that later in my life I would be able to minister to children. And as they grow up and as they go through this and as they endure what's happening in our, uh, our uh, degenerating society that is quickly going downhill and the children are paying a supreme price for the actions of the adults and of the parents. <clears throat> and so when we read here in the book of Luke, he said, except you come to me as a little child. That should encourage every one of us in this house today, every last one of you, should be greatly encouraged to understand that he doesn't require a Ph.D. to approach him. You do not have to be a master in any discipline. You do not have to have an IQ of 190 to approach him. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be the, a part of the elite. You can simply come as a little child. As a matter of fact, what it does is set forth some things in Scripture that are designed to be received and accepted as little children because God ordains it to be simple and to be received. Now, don't make no mistake about it. You take the Word of God. I don't care how smart you are. It's going to challenge your mind if you want to really get into it. It's going to drive you to points where you're going to have to do some real praying and thinking. 
But many of the things in the Bible are written on a level and are produced on a level to where anyone, I don't care how, how low on the stature you are, can understand it and receive it. And so this morning I'm going to preach you a message, He touched me. He touched me. It is the touch of the Master that makes all the difference in the world. Some of you are still spinning your wheels and wasting your time with religion. That's all you can think about is the Baptist church or the Catholic church or the Methodist church. And you think it's such a big deal because you belong to thus and thus church. Some of you are still attached to men. You're a disciple of a certain preacher who built great ministry and left behind a bunch of buildings. And that's how you relate to Christianity is through some man. Or you were part of a movement, and by, by, by being part of that movement, then you feel like that that's your identity, and you want everybody else to be part of that movement. But I'm going to talk to you about the one and only, the only one that matters, that ever has mattered, and that ever will matter, is our Lord Jesus Christ. And He touched me. In 1973, He touched me, and He spoke to my soul, and He convicted me. i would never had conviction in my life. I didn't know what conviction was. I was, living a, I was living an ungodly life, but he touched me. He came to me in such a way that I understood I was going to hell, and he convicted me, and he brought me to my knees, and he brought tears out of my soul, and I repented, and I said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And when I said it, I meant it, and when I raised my head up, I was in a brand new world, and I was a different man from that day on, and my friend has done nothing but get sweeter by the day. My salvation is the most precious thing to me upon the face of this earth. I know, I know whom I have known, and I know that he's able Able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day because he touched me. My friend on the back porch of this house right up here, no, for, no more than a stone's throw at about two or three o'clock in the morning on that back porch, God Almighty came down to a preacher that had been preaching for years and he touched me in a way that I'd never been touched before and he changed my ministry. He did something for me that day that let me know that there's a world that an awful lot of people are critiquing that seem to have knowledge of and they don't have a clue what they're talking about. He touched me. He came down upon my soul and I felt the power of God move in me in a way that I'd never known. I felt the power of God not only move in me but on me, over me. He began to open up my soul to spiritual truths up until that point that had been theoretical, that had been analytical, that had been something I'd learned in theology. But now I knew firsthand what it was to experience the outpouring of the power of the Holy Spirit of God. After that happened to me, I'd, I'd witness to people and tell them about it. And they say, oh yeah, that happened to me. And I knew in my soul they didn't have a clue what I was talking about. I knew they did not have a clue what I was talking about. But because of pride, we put up this, we put this wall up, we put this show up, we create this facade, and we can hide behind it. But folks, the bottom line is that some of you are just barely making it day in and day out. Your Christian life has degenerated to nothing but boredom. You never read your Bible. You never pray. You spend your day in your evening when you get home from work. You turn on the tube. You sit there and watch garbage. You listen to junk coming into your mind. Your heart's full of hell. And yet you wonder, why am I not happy? And where did my power go? It's because he t hasn't touched you. He needs to touch you. As these little children teach us a lesson, and that lesson is a simple lesson, if you are honest and sincere in your heart and in your soul, and you're looking for something from God, he's got it for you. Amen. But there are certain things that he gives freely, and salvation is given freely because he touches you. Hallelujah to God for that. But then there are things that God reserves for those that have a hunger and a desire for something greater and deeper in the Lord. The Lord is the answer to your deadness, your sickness, your, your problems. He's the answer to everything that's in your life. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's made alive by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Religion points you to methodology. Religion points you to, to, to ability, to humanity, to the flesh, to this, to that, this, that. It muddles the scene. But the truth of the matter is, the work of the Holy Spirit of God is to make the Lord Jesus come alive in our lives. And he will come alive in your life if you're hungry. The Apostle James says, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Well, I tried it. Preaching didn't work. How long did you try it? Well, I gave him a week. Two weeks, a month, 
Do you understand how long it takes, my friend, before you really begin to understand how deep these things with God are? where he abides, where he resides, how he wants to manifest himself to us. He wants to leave it to, to, to make himself known to our soul and to our spirit. We are of Christ. We were born of Christ. We live in Christ. Our life is about Christ. And the word of the living God is a powerful, powerful, powerful thing. The longer I live and the longer that I'm born again and saved by the grace of God, the more that I realize that we're just like a bunch of ants down here on this earth running to and fro. We're just running here and we're running there. We're going here and we're going there. But very, very few, and I'm talking about Christians now, the ants. Very, 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 very few Christians I've observed down through the years have a real hunger for God Almighty. And you crawl in that closet, open the door, get on your knees, shut the door, turn a fan on or something to shut this world out, get in there. I don't care if you pray five minutes, pray. And do it every day. Do it every day of your life. Don't, let, don't miss a day. Keep doing it. Stay at it. Stay at it. Stay at it. And you'll begin to see something happen inside your soul and inside your spirit that will begin to change you, form you, mold you. But not only that, he'll begin to manifest himself to you. Peace and a calm and a power begins to descend upon your heart because he touches you. The thing that we're starving to death for today is not more, uh, more meetings or more effort or more organization or more ability. What we're starving for today is the touch from God. Yes. Amen. Amen. A touch from God. You still believe all you're supposed to believe. You still got your Bible. And you're still, you know, still trying, trying the best you can to live a Christian life. But there's no power in it. No power. The church is powerless. This is why the world has a, it's such, it's such an enticing draw to our young people. I watch these kids grow up in church. And I watch them reach, reach, up, reach up to the age 17, 18, 19, 20. First thing you know, they're out. They walk out the door. I watch my grandchildren grow. And the kids that they go to church with, that they, go to, that they went to school with. And these kids raised up in church. They learn to talk, learn to walk, smell right, look right, talk right. Everything's right. But my friend, when they get out of there, some of them go out here and they go just as wild as they can. Why? I'll tell you why. They've never had a touch of reality, not the real thing. They've got what men consider Christianity to be, form them, shape them. I can get up in this pulpit week after week and tell you every move to make, micromanage your life, tell you to get up, go down, everything you should do, who your friends ought to be, who you ought to marry. Some of the preachers think that's the way to do it, create an identity for you, but it's all man-made. That's all it is. It's man-made. There's no power in it. The power comes from those of you who will move yourself and separate yourself from the crowd and will draw apart from, unto God and begin to seek the face of the Lord and get serious about walking with God and serious about communion and serious about the power of God. And when that happens, you'll see God get serious with you. Drawn out of God, he said, and he'll draw an out of you. Throughout that New Testament, we've got people that were touched by the Lord. As a matter of fact, anybody that ever got anything from God was touched by him. In the book of Mark, chapter number 5 and verse number 41, we read these words. Mark 5, 41. He took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talith kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. Notice he took her by the hand. And straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished with great astonishment. And he charged them straightly that no man should know it and commanded that something should be given her to eat. He touched her. Notice, he touched a dead body. A priest in the Old Testament was absolutely forbidden to touch a dead body. It would have contaminated him and his priesthood. It would render him ineffectual, unqualified to minister to God. But it's different with the Lord Jesus Christ. He can reach forth his hand and touch that which is dead. And that which is dead will not corrupt him. But virtue and life will go forth from him to them. And that's where every one of us was one day. If you've been saved, you were dead. 
You thought you knew who you were, where you were going. You thought you understood life. You thought you understood God. You thought everything. You justified yourself by all the people around you. Today it's easy to hide behind people. For the vast majority of everybody you see, they're on their road to destruction. So you can hide behind them. But once he touches you, once you understand what that hand is touching you, then he draws you out of deadness and draws you to life and puts life in your soul. Thanks be unto God for that life. It's been a long time since I preached at Temple Baptist Church and had such a quietness as I've had in this house this morning. It is the move of the Holy Spirit of God in the hearts of the people. It's not that you're indifferent. Most of you act shocked because of the religion that prevails today. Oh, how sad it is. We're happy living in the peripheral, happy living out here in the wilderness, happy, satisfied, at ease in Zion. I think that's the term for it because there's no hunger for God. A country like America that is so prosperous and so, so materialistic that people have so much stuff that keeps them busy. They go from one thing to the next. They don't think about their soul. Satan has done his job if he can keep your mind on your car, your job, your golfing, your tennis, your fishing, your, your sports, your, your whatever, just anything. There's nothing wrong with any of this stuff in itself, but he's got your mind on it. You fill your day up with it, but there's no time for God. In 73, when he touched me, I felt lost and gone to hell. Never had felt like that before. But what that did to me was get my attention. Has God ever really gotten your attention? Really? Have you ever really come to a point in your life where he reached down and took you by the hand, the unsaved hand, and said, rise up and give you life? Life. You say, preacher, I'm trying to find. You can't find life. I'm trying to make my life. That's wasting your time. I'm joining churches, preacher. I'm, be, I'm learning the catechism. I'm learning to be religious. I'm learning what it is to be a good. That's waste of your time. As a matter of fact, that's the worst thing you could do. What you need to do is to listen to the simple voice of the Son of God as he speaks into your heart and says, you need me. You're lost and nothing you can do that's going to make your life any better. You're, if you live the best life a human being could live, you'd still go to hell. You need me. Jesus is the only way of salvation. He touched over here in the book of uh, Matthew chapter number 8 and verse 1. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. Behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, a leper, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Now, I didn't really understand much about leprosy. I'd read a lot about it, you know, and, and, and what, what you could until Tommy Tillman came into this church. And when Tommy Tillman came into this church, he brought slides with him from Thailand. And when he got up here on the stage, he put up the screen, he started showing us slides of lepers in Thailand. And I'd never in my life seen anything like that. And I spent four years in the military traveling the world. I'd seen a lot of stuff, but I'd never seen anything like that. Literally open pus, running pus, sores, flesh falling off the body. A sickening sight like you could not believe. It was a horrid sight to see the living death of a leper. It's unbelievable. Until you see it, you can't understand what I'm talking about. And the Bible says that he put forth his hand and he touched him. Now on these lepers, they had part of their skin and some of it looked like your skin. I mean, the, you know, the, some of it looked presentable, but some of that skin you wouldn't touch. There's no way under the sun that you'd reach forth your hand and touch that open pus, boiling, rotting, filthy, sore 
But I can't help but believe that when he put forth his hand and he touched the leper, he touched him right on the leprosy because that's what it was about. He touched him right on the leprosy. Oh, how unclean I was. Oh, Lord God help us. How unclean from the toe, from my feet to my head. I was unclean in every way that a man could be unclean. Everything there was, I was. Lord, have mercy, help me. I was a lost, hell-bound sinner, make no excuses for anything. I was going to hell and I deserved it. I was unclean. I was filthy. And he reached forth his hand and he touched me. And he touched the filth. Yes, hallelujah to God. He touched the filth. And thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. It was healed just like that. Now, how do you know, preacher? Because it was no longer rising up from inside my soul with this driving, burning, fleshly desire to do all this stuff, to go to all these places, to be all this stuff. Something new came inside me. A fountain came inside me. A water started. A river started. A power was rising up inside my soul that was different than I'd ever been in there before. He led me to springs of living waters. Amen. He touched me. He cleansed me. The Bible says, to whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. You can't change that. Now, some of you have been good people all your life. I'm glad for that. Some of you were raised in good, clean homes with good, clean parents. I'm thankful for that. Some of you never went out here in this world and did all the stuff and, and never contaminated yourself, and you essentially have lived a pretty clean, moral life all your life. I'm glad for that. But it doesn't make any difference what kind of a life you lived when it comes down to the saving grace of God. It takes as much grace to save you as it does me or anybody else. It makes no difference. All is sin and comes short of the glory of God. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? My heart was deceitful. It was filthy. It was wicked. But I want to tell you a principle that you cannot deny. You cannot deny this principle. To whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. Amen. 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 You take a stinking, filthy, stinking, filthy prostitute out of some hell hole and let God save her. You may turn your nose up at that one and you may say to yourself, I was never as sorry and low down as you. And I've never, you know, and, I, and I've always been. But I'm going to tell you this right now. You take her out of there and you let God Almighty save her soul and her heart will be filled with love. She'll be filled with the Holy Ghost and she'll praise God for the rest of her life. For I'm not what I used to be, she'll tell you. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah to God. That's the grace of God. It knows no limitations. There is no hell hole the grace of God cannot reach into. There is no sin that he cannot forgive. His hand is not shortened. His arm is not shortened. He can reach down to where you are and he can save your soul. And make no mistake about it, buddy, when he does, you got somebody that's going to love him. It was Mary Magdalene, if you mind, if you please. It was Mary Magdalene on that Sunday morning. Mary Magdalene on that Sunday morning that had seven devils cast out of her that showed up at that tomb because she loved him. To whom much is forgiven, the same loveth much. I love him. Oh my, the sins were long. The list was long. It was wicked and it was vile and it was unclean. <laughs> but he forgave me. I love him. Oh, yes, I love him. Oh, how I love him. Every day of my life, I tell him I love him. I get up in the morning and I say, I love you, Lord. I go to bed at night and I say, I love you, Lord. I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and I love you, Lord. I tell him I love him. I tell him I'm loving him all night while you're asleep. I'm loving God because of what he did for me. For I know right now, if it hadn't been for the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd be screaming in hell at this moment, and I deserve to be there, but he loved me, and he gave himself for me. The love of God is just indescribable. I can't explain it to you. The only thing I can say about the love of God, you gotta experience it to understand what I'm talking about, to whom much is forgiven. 
the same loveth much. I've looked back at some of the lives of some of these preachers that I have respect for, read their testimony, some of the women I've known the ministry, looked at their testimony and watched them, and I've seen some of the sorriest, low-down, filthy, dirty, vilest creatures you ever met in your life, somebody you wouldn't even give the time of day to, yet God Almighty reached down and touched them. He saved them, and now they're a witness for God. You know why he does that, don't you? You take somebody like that, they can walk down here on Skid Row. They can walk up to a wino that's got a bottle of cheap wine, if he's got any of it left, in his rags and his filth and stinking. And he looks at you and he thinks, my, how you must think you're so much better than me. And sure, a lot of them think that. But you can walk right up to him and look down, take him by the hand and say, let me tell you what he did for me. I've been right where you are. I know exactly how you feel. There's something about being forgiven. <laughs> oh, yes, there is. There's something about being forgiven. You just can't explain it. It's like the love of God. You got to experience it. The first thing that happens when God forgives you, he lifts a burden. Oh, yes, he lifts a burden. Some of you carrying a burden right now, you just can't handle it. It's getting to you. It's bothering you. You know why? Because you still got a conscience. There's something about being forgiven that lifts a burden. I mean, it's just lifted off of you, not carrying it anymore. You can just jump up and fly. That burden's gone. Sin is a burdensome thing. Oh, how it drives a man down. It's a slave driver. And it knows no limitations. It binds you up. It makes a slave out of you. But when a man's forgiven, that's the first thing. You just, you just feel light. You just, I felt light in that living room. Oh, when I bowed my head, what a burden I had. But when I raised my head, it was just like that, just gone, lifted up. But I felt clean, too. There's something about being forgiven that makes you feel clean. It just makes you feel clean. You got that old history, you got that old, you got that old mind, remembers all that stuff. But the Holy Ghost, for however he does it, that's God's business, he does it. He comes in there and makes you feel clean. Makes you feel like you never did anything in your life. Makes you feel like a little baby. Just innocent, just clean. And just everything smells better, looks better. The whole world has changed before you. It does. It puts a spring in your step, a song in your heart. And your mind now is not muddled up and, 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 and vile and full of guile and constantly thinking about sin, sin, sin. You're just free. It just cleans you up. But then he puts joy in there. If you've been forgiven, you know what joy is. Oh, joy. What joy, oh boy, joy is a good thing. Oh, it is. Oh, listen. I go out on the back porch and we got a hoot owl out there. And I said, sing to me now tonight. And boy, he'll start singing. How many know what a hoot owl sounds like? It's quite a thing, boy. It's quite a thing. And I said, now you're not singing to me. I know that. Folks, I understand all that. But he may be too. Who knows? I mean, God Almighty is God. But I listened to that hoot owl. And I sat on that back porch and listened to that hoot owl. And the other day I was sitting on the back porch listening to the hoot owl. And I heard a commotion off to my right hand side. And I looked and here came a doe. Here came another doe. Here came another doe. Here came another doe. Here came another one. Six does came down through there. Worked their way around through the woods. And I thought I saw one of them look up at me. But I wasn't sure about it. And then they went on around, they went on out, and there they went. Six of them right across the back. And I thought, there ain't many people around here seeing this. I'm sitting there, and it cost me a dime, brother. I'm sitting on the back porch watching these deer walking right through my backyard. And here they are, and they go right out through there. And I thought to myself, thank you, Lord. You made that creature. It's in its element. It's doing what it's supposed to be doing. And it's I'm probably just as satisfied as it can be. And it's not full of guile. And it's not full of the world. It's not full of hell. And thank you, Lord, that I can sit here and look at the creation and glorify God. Amen. When I see stuff like that, some folks think, you know, it ain't no big deal. It's a big deal to me. Yes, big deal to me. I told you about the hawk that killed a squirrel couple of years ago. And that hawk killed that squirrel. And that hawk flew up to a tree right over there. He's about 100 feet from me, 200 feet. That hawk flew up into that tree. And that hawk, for the next two or three hours, just sat there in that tree, wanting everybody in the neighborhood to know it had just killed a squirrel. <laughs> Say, how do you know it? I could tell by what he was saying. That hawk was screaming. It didn't do that normally. 
the hawk's moving around or it's up in the sky, but that hawk sat right there. And it, uh, and it wanted everybody to know. It was, it was proud of what it had done. And I took it all in. I took every bit of it in. I enjoyed it. Because if you're full of guile and you've got to be watching some pornography on the internet or the pornography on your television screen, or you've got to be listening to some four-letter words feeding into your heart and into your soul, you're full of hell. <laughs> come off of it. And come down there and say, God, cleanse me. I'm bound in this stuff. I need help. And he'll cleanse you. And then he'll let you look at the world in a whole new light. Beautiful. I was driving to... The other day I was going to, left the house and going the back way to get over to a place. And I came across the top of the hill, and there at the bottom of the hill, an old barn. Not too long ago they took all the siding off of it, and they left it. So it was a post and beam barn. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Post and beam. It was an old-fashioned barn. Been there a long time. Long time. And when they took the siding off of the barn, you could see the hay inside, and you could see and. And I looked at that, and I'd slow down every time I came through there because I was looking at history. That barn had been there a long time. Well, I topped the hill the other day and went across, and I came down, and there the, the whole thing was on the ground, and the roof was sitting right on top of it. And you wouldn't believe how I felt. That was awful. I thought this old barn stood here for a long time. It's probably seen a lot of people come and go from the inside of it. It's probably kept been here. People wore out at the end of the day and they're going home. Here stands this barn. They put their hay up inside the barn. They've had their cattle and their horses and all everything else. And now all of a sudden it's sitting on the ground. And I thought to myself, what happened to that barn? Then I got to thinking, well, maybe they figured it was going to collapse and they didn't want some kid to be playing under it or somebody. So they knocked it on down and they, it's laying on the ground now. And there it is. If you want to see that barn, I can't think of the name of that road, but it turns right off Emory Road. And there's the roof sitting right on top of it. I thought, that's life. That's this world. It's going to come to an end. I, I, I love the old stuff. I do. I don't get excited when they tear down an old house and build a shopping center. And I don't get a bit excited about that. No, 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 no. No. Don't get excited. I love the old paths. I love the old songs. I love the old preaching, the old music, the old way, the old-fashioned way. We're not smarter than our grandparents and great-grandparents. I love the old stuff. I've got a, I've got a, 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 a bayonet that might have been on a weapon in the Civil War. I've got that bayonet. I've had that thing now for some time. It's old. It's old. If you want to know what it looks like, just get any old book of the Civil War and look at those muskets and look at the bayonet that sits on top. That thing's that long. And look at that, that bayonet that sits on top of that, and you'll see what that's what I've got. That's what it looks like. I wouldn't take anything for that. That's worth a lot to me. Why? Because it's old. It's old. This new stuff's killing us. Sucking the very life out of us. How do you like your new life? How's it going for you? What are you talking about, preacher? Your new Christianity. How's it going? How's it working? Why don't you come back to that old path? Amen. That old way. Why don't you do the church of Ephesus? He says, you've left your first love. Come back to where it started. Everybody knows where it started. You could come this morning and you could get on your knees and you could say, Lord, I'm going to let my mind go back to that place where I got saved and it all started. I'm going to come back to that point and I'm going to start again. I'm going to start again. And I can take you right now to the spot. And if they tore that house down, I could still take you to the spot where I changed from a child of hell to a child of God. Amen. I go back to that spot a lot of times. A lot. I go right back there in my mind and remember what happened to me. Some of you need to do that today. Won't you do it? Come back to where you need to come back to. Come back to it. As David said, oh, how I would love to have some water 
From where? From Bethlehem. That was his house. That's where he grew up. That was his home. And they went and got him some, and then he poured it out on the ground. Remember? He was thinking about where he came from, what it used to be like back years ago. Would you come down? Come back there. Father, in Jesus' name, I preach what you put on my heart, Lord. I don't know the way back. You don't need to know the way. You need to know the person. <laughs> worry about the way. You don't have to worry about what it takes to live a Christian life. Just the person. Fall in love with Jesus once again. That's your first love. Do you remember that? How wonderful that was? How precious that first love. Oh, my. raised my head one day right after I got saved and I said to myself you mean to tell me all of this existed and I didn't know anything about it I didn't not until I was born again did I have a clue would you come back to him how's the old song go I wandered far from home now I'm coming home and that's what we do 99 out of 100 Christians they just kind of wander off they don't consciously choose they just kind of drift away that's what happens to most Christians things get involved they get in this and get in that and something here or there they just kind of drift away well come back to him what do we got brother? I'm coming home Lord I'm coming home 